Morning, YouTubers. Got a matching brush for this terrible hoodie that I have. Awesome, right? So anyways, on today's video, I thought I would just do a quick term overview. And by quick, of course, this is going to last far too long because I like to talk too much. But my previous videos, I felt I didn't define a couple terms very well and I didn't explain how stick welding works as good as I probably could have. So I just wanted to briefly go back over that stuff. Now, if you have a pretty good idea how stick welding works or you understand like what a stinger is and ground clamp, this video probably isn't for you. And trust me, you won't hurt my feelings if you skip over this. Since, you know, I'm kind of aiming this towards as someone totally new to welding, like you just picked up your first welder for Christmas and you want to learn how to use it and you don't even know what anything is. This, this is that kind of video. So anyways, let's get into it. So imagine that I made a few mistakes and didn't mention some things. Story of my life. So first thing I want to mention is this is a stinger or electrode holder. I probably mentioned it to some extent in the video, but I thought I didn't mention that enough and I could have done better and given you a couple examples. So in the case of this little red stick welder here, this is the electrode holder for it. Very simple. This is the one I use for the blue welder little bit heavier duty. This they claim is rated for 250 amps. It would probably handle that all day. That one says 200 amps and it probably wouldn't, but that doesn't matter. I'm not comparing these two welders from functioning, but just to give you an idea. So whatever stick welder you have, it's got a stinger electrode holder. Make sure you, you don't exceed the capacity stamped on it. If it doesn't have a capacity, well then you must be good to go and it, it's unlimited. So you have a ground clamp because we're welding with electricity. You have to have a path to return to the welder, which in the case of this is a stamped steel one. So you need both of those two things to stick weld. Now the third thing that you're definitely going to need is a stick welder. So both of these two machines are stick welders. Now this machine here is more or less designed to be a TIG welder that can stick weld. This is designed as a stick welder that is not marketed as being capable of a TIG welder. But one of the interesting things is, is that any stick welder can technically TIG weld in what's called scratch art TIG or scratch start TIG. Now, I'm not going to demonstrate that in today's video, but down the line, I probably will set up a TIG set up with this and just show you that, yeah, with the cheapest welder known to man almost, you can TIG weld and you can actually do some pretty good welds. It's just not very easy and can be frustrating, but that's besides the point. So both of these have a lot more in common from a stick perspective than they have dissimilar. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's true. So both of these have two wires coming out, which uh, obviously your ground clamp and your electrode holder now you have to, don't pay any attention to this. This is just for gas for TIG welding. But yeah, you have two outputs. In the case of both of these, in order to change your polarity, you have to pull out and then reverse them. Now the stick welding process in my video, as I had mentioned, is done typically with DCEN. So that means, or excuse me, DCEP. See, I caught myself there, I was almost wrong. DCEP. The electrode holder is hooked to the positive output of the welder and the ground clamp goes on the negative. The TIG process is done in DCEN. So for most of your stick rods, you want to make sure your holder is wired to the positive output. Now for you guys with the AC welders, like the tombstones and the... Uh, um, the Miller dial arcs, the AC machines, or no, they're, uh, what the hell are those called? Ah, whatever, you'll remember. The AC only stick welders, because those weld on AC where your current is alternating positive and negative, those, the output doesn't matter. Like, and most of those have pre-wired connectors internally, so it doesn't matter. Like, you can hook the rod to either side either wire doesn't matter because they're 50 50 dce and versus ep so those you're good to go 
A couple other important things to mention. Both of these welders actually function under very similar ideas. Now, how they get to the point of outputting their current and their voltage is a little different, especially if you have an older transformer machine, those are also different. But the whole goal of these things is simply to take wall outlet power like I got over there or a 220, 240 plug and convert that higher voltage. So your 120 to 240 volt, your 20 to 50 amp circuit and convert that to higher amperage, lower voltage. So this little red welder outputs 140 amps, this blue one outputs 210, but that is at say 30, 35 volts. That's nowhere near the voltage of your wall outlet. Okay, now with the welding process with stick, to, just to give you a really rudimentary idea, stick welding operates between about 15 volts and about 30 volts for most rods under about 200 amps. So a pretty narrow window, and then they operate at an amperage of anywhere between say 50 and 150 amps is very common. So much lower voltage and much higher amperage. And that's why like you look at your leads for these, same thing for this guy, very thick power cables for these things on the output. And the reason is, is that when you have very high amperage, the resistance of the wire becomes a detriment. And if you don't have a very fat, you know, real thick power wire, it's going to build up excessive heat due to the resistance, and then it's going to melt the wire. So that's why on welders like stick welders, you see such big, heavy wire. And the longer the run you need to make, the longer or the bigger the gauge has to be. And that's simply because they operate at such low voltages. Now, you could technically make a stick welder, I, I suppose, that would operate at higher voltage, but at a certain point, it becomes dangerous. Like, you don't want to have 120 volts live in your stinger and sit here and try and weld with that because the odds of you getting shocked are extremely high. Which brings up my next point and something I didn't really mention at all in my Arc Force video, nor did I in the intro video. But all stick welders have what's called a resting voltage or an open circuit voltage. And let's take a look at this because this is so easy for me to explain. This welder right now, the ground clamp's on my welding table over there somewhere, and then the electrode holder's over there. So it's an open circuit. I'm not actually welding. The voltage on this is 77.9, so about 78 volts. Okay, I've tested that guy and that's about 80 volts open circuit. That's almost the same as like a wall outlet. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever put a fork or tried to put a, a knife into an outlet and got a little zap, like that's no joke. I mean, is it going to hurt you bad? No, but you know, if you had a wet hand and, you know, grabbed on a steel pipe and put that fork in, I mean, you'd be lit up like a damn Christmas tree. So clearly... Uh, you, you want the voltage to be reasonably safe and 80 volted, volts, you could get a shock from this machine if you had a sweaty hand and you like accidentally became the ground path for it. So you want to be smart around stick welders, especially those old uh, transformer machines like them big Ideal Arc 250 Lincolns and those super old like 1940s ones that have like 100, 110 volt open circuit. Like I own one that literally I tested it, it had 110 open circuit voltage. That's literally a wall outlet, which you can get a pretty good spark gap or spark an arc off of that. And the thing had a hundred and I think it was 180 amp. You could put 180 amps behind that. Like if you, if you grab that stinger or the electrode with a wet hand, it could lay you out and put you in the hospital. And that's one of the reasons why, like this machine, has a voltage reduction setting to where you can lower the 80 volt open circuit down to like 24 or something, 20 volt, just to reduce if you're in a humid environment or whatever, reduce the possibility of getting shocked. Now, I'm not saying 80 volts, honestly, this isn't that, it's not unsafe. You just wear welding gloves, be smart if you're completely sweaty, don't be grabbing like the ground clamp 
just be smart about it. You know, the open circuit voltage being fairly high will actually help you because you can strike an arc with your rod a lot easier at 80 volts than you can at 20. At 20 volts, you're going to be sitting there banging that rod against a plate trying to get the arc to start for a while, and then it will. Well, at 80 volts, you can kind of rub it, and it'll fire up for you. So you definitely, the higher the open circuit voltage, generally speaking, the better. But again, 80 volts, I would say, is about the limit. Any higher than that, like you can really start shocking yourself without intention, intending on it. All right, little quick book learning, and this lesson's done. I'll get you out quick so you can go have fun and go to the bar or whatever. Um, stick and TIG operate slightly different than MIG and flux core. Now, obviously, the process itself is a lot different, but the way they output power is a little bit different. And this is kind of important stuff to know. So stick and TIG operate under what's known as constant current, okay? Variable voltage. These aren't just chicken scratches. They mean something. When you look at specs on welders, especially stick welders, it's very common to see these two things. All they're referring to, constant current, which that's the process, how it operates. When you set your machine for, say, 90 amps, that machine is going to output 90 amps or thereabouts constantly. It's variable voltage output. The voltage is not controlled with stick and TIG with a foot pedal or with, with any setting. You don't adjust voltage. Your voltage is adjusted with your arc gap. So here's your rod. Here's your rod here. This is your molten puddle. If you hold a tight arc gap, and the arc is depicted here, your voltage will say be 18 volts. If you lengthen that arc gap where that rod is quite a ways off of your metal plate, your arc voltage might be 30 volts. So with stick and TIG, you're not adjusting voltage. You are actually at real time with your arc gap, okay? But no matter what the arc gap, tight or long, 90 amps, if that's what you set it at, it's 90 amps. MIG and flux core wire operate under what's called the CVVA, so constant voltage, variable amperage. What this means is, is that when you adjust wire welders, you typically, on simple ones, you just are adjusting the voltage it operates at, and then the amperage is just a byproduct of how fast your wire feed is, okay? And it is variable. It's not constant current. In one way, and this is very dumbing it down, and I apologize to all you welding engineers, not that you're watching this video anyways, but a very dumbed down way to think of it, and I'm not saying that you guys aren't smart either, by the way, but is to think whatever the amperage is necessary is what the machine is going to output. And it is variable based on any number of things, like your travel speed or how much how big of a weld you've already deposited. Like it's all variable. How hot the wire is, it's all variable. It's just whatever the amperage needs to be, the machine outputs it. But you're not setting voltage with stick and TIG. You're setting amperage and with MIG and flux core wire, you're setting voltage. When I get into more of MIG welding, I'm gonna cover all of this in detail, but for right now, just understand that. And that's, any machine, doesn't matter how you adjust the amperage, that's what you're adjusting. And your voltage, because you do have voltage, is just your arc gap. All right, to wrap this video up, I thought I would mention, since this is a beginner's kind of class, get a good pair of stick welding gloves. Now, you'll see me kind of break the habit and wear these guys. And these are actually better gloves than I thought they were going to be. Um, they're kind of pricey, but they're better than the Harbor Freight ones. But anyways, these really aren't cut out for stick welding. One of the biggest things is, is that stick welding, you weld at pretty high amperage, and you put a lot of heat in stuff. And I'll tell you what, grabbing a plate with these things, like I've kind of melted the fingers, like I split this finger already just from really abuse. Stick welding is not easy on gloves. Now, 
these are fairly new. I've owned these things for, I don't know, three years. I don't do that much stick welding, but these things have held up really good. And getting a good pair of stick welding gloves is going to go a long way. And I'm telling you, these things, you can hold on to some pretty hot stuff and not burn your hands. Like, get a good pair of gloves like these. They're, uh, I don't know, 30 bucks. Don't buy them cheap gardening gloves either. Trust me on that. I mean, maybe when you get good, you can get away with it. But treat yourself right. I'm telling you guys. Get something decent. With that said, that's what I got for this video. I thought I would just throw this out kind of as a bonus thing. I'm still going to get two more videos out this week because I'm feeling a lot better. I was sick earlier for Christmas, so I just, I'm happy to get back in the shop and do some stuff. Like, you guys have no idea. Anyways, if you got any comments, questions, you know where to put them. I will see you in the next video. Thanks.